Puss in Boots. This is a story that's been around for 300 years. This is a different um, version of the story. It might have some similarities to the one that you might be familiar with. This one is told by Charles Perrault. A miller had three sons, and when he died, he left them nothing but his mill, his donkey, and his cat. The sons didn't send for a lawyer because they knew their whole legacy would have gone for fees, but it didn't take them long to decide who should get what. The eldest got the mill, the second got the donkey, and nothing was left for the youngest but the cat. He wasn't very happy about it. My brothers will be able to work together and make a decent living, he said. But once I've eaten my cat and made a muff out of the fur, I'm sure to starve. The cat, who had been listening while pretending not to, said with a serious, sympathetic look, Don't worry, master. Just get me a sack and a pair of boots to carry me through the brambles, and you'll see that you haven't come out as badly as you think. The cat's master was not exactly convinced, but then he remembered that he had seen the cat do some very clever things such as catching rats and mice by hanging his paws or hiding in the flower and playing dead. So he said to himself, oh, well, why not give it a try? When Puss had got what he asked for, he pulled on his fine boots, threw the sack over his shoulder, and, holding the strings between his four paws, went out to a warren where there were lots of rabbits. He put bran and sow thistle in the sack, and waited for some young rabbit who hadn't caught on to the ruses of the world to poke his nose into the sack. No sooner had he settled himself than a hare-brained young rabbit walked right in. Pull, Puss pulled the strings tight and killed the rabbit without mercy or compassion. Proud of his kill, he went straight to the royal palace and asked to see the king. They showed him into his majesty's apartments, where he bowed low and said, Sire, I've brought you a wild rabbit, which the Marquis of Carabas, that was the name Puss had decided to give his master, has bidden me to offer you with his compliments. Tell your master, said the king, that his gift has given me a great pleasure, and that I thank him kindly. The next time Puss went out with his sack, he hid in a wheat field, when two partridges walked into the sack, he pulled the strings and caught them both. The king accepted the two partridges gladly and told his servants to reward the cat for his pains. For two or three months, Puss went on bringing the king game from his master's preserve. Then one day, when he knew the king would be gone for going for a ride along the river with his daughter, who was the most beautiful princess in the whole world. Puss said to his master, Do as I say, and your fortune is made. Just go for a swim in the river. I'll show you the exact spot, and leave the rest to me. The Marquis of Carabas followed Puss's instructions to the letter, though he couldn't imagine what good it would do him. While he was swimming, the king passed by, and Puss shouted with all his might, Help! Help! The Marquis of Carabas is drowning! Hearing the shouts, the king stuck his head out of his carriage door and recognized the cat who had brought him so much gain. Hurry! He called out to his guards. Hurry to rescue the Marquis of Carabas! While the poor Marquis was being pulled out of the river, Puss went over to the carriage and spoke to the king. While my master was swimming, he said, some thieves came and made off with his clothes, even though I yelled, Stop, thief! at the top of my voice. The rascal had hidden them under a stone. Uh, what's he up to? The king ordered the officers of the wardrobe to fetch one of his finest suits for the Marquis of Carabas. Once the Marquis had changed, the king made a great fuss over him. And since the fine clothes brought out his good looks, the king's daughter took a liking to him, too. The Marquis gave her two or three tender glances, and before you knew it, she had fallen in love with him. The king proposed that he join them in the carriage for a drive. Delighted that his plan was turning out so well, Puss went on ahead. When he saw some peasants mowing a meadow, he said to them, 
Friends, I want you to tell the king that this meadow belongs to the Marquis of Carabas. If you don't, you'll be cut up as small as sausage meat. Do you think people are going to listen to a cat? Let's see. When the king came along, he asked the mowers who owned the meadow they were mowing. Puss's threat had scared them out of their wits, and they answered in unison, The Marquis of Carabas owns it. A fine meadow you've got there, said the king to the Marquise. Yes, indeed, sire, said the Marquise. Year in, year out, it yields a goodly crop. Puss, who was still going on ahead, saw some harvesters and said to them, I want you to say that all of this wheat belongs to the Marquise of Carabas. If you don't, you'll be cut up into sausage meat. The king who came along a few moments later, wanted to know who owned all of the wheat he was looking at. The Marquis of Carabas, said the harvesters, and again the king was well pleased with the Marquis. Puss, who was, on, um, who was going on ahead of the carriage, kept saying the same thing to all the people he met, and the king marveled at the size of the Marquis's estate. At last, Puss came to a beautiful castle that belonged to an ogre. He was the richest ogre in the world, for all the lands the king had passed through belonged to him. Puss, who had been careful to find out all about this ogre, went into the castle and asked leave to call on him. What a pity it would be, he said, to be so near his castle and not stop to pay my respects. The ogre welcomed him as affably as the ogre can, and bade him to be seated. I've been told, said Puss, that you can turn yourself into any animal you please. A lion, for instance, or, e instance, or even an elephant. That is true, said the ogre, and I'll prove it. I'll turn myself into, an, uh, into a lion. Puss was so terrified at seeing a lion right there in the room that he scrambled up onto the roof, which wasn't easy because boots are no good for walking on tiles, and it was dangerous besides. A little later, when Puss saw that the ogre was an ogre again, he came down and admitted that the lion had given him a bad scare. When he'd caught his breath, Puss said, I hear you can turn yourself into small animals, too. A rat or a mouse, for instance. That seems impossible. It seems impossible, does it? said the ogre. A second later, the ogre was gone, and a mouse was scurrying across the floor. Puss pounced and caught him and gobbled him up. He gobbled up the ogre, you guys. Just then, the king came to the beautiful castle, and of course, he wanted to go in. When Puss heard the sound of the carriage rumbling over the drawbridge, he ran out to meet the king. Welcome, your majesty, he said, to the Marquis of Carabas Castle. My dear Marquis, cried the king, is it possible that this castle is yours too? What could be more beautiful than this courtyard and all these buildings around it? Let's have a look inside. The Marquis gave the young princess his hand. The king led the way, and all went in. In the great hall, they found a banquet that the ogre had ordered for his friends. These friends had just arrived, but when they saw the king's carriage, they ran away. The king was charmed by the Marquise's manners and estates, and the king's daughter had favored him from, from the first. So, after five or six beakers of wine, the king said to him, you have only to say the word, my dear Marquis, and I'll take you for my son-in-law. The Marquis said the word with a low, elaborate bow and married the princess that same day. They literally, they just met. Here's Puss over here in his little boots. And there's the big feast and the large table with all the food. Puss became a great lord and gave up chasing mice, except just once in a while for the fun of it. Puss and Boots